The following audio is from Paul Tripp Ministries. For more information about Paul Tripp Ministries, visit www.paultripp.com. It was for me a moment of danger and grace. I was 17 years old. It was the end of my senior year of high school. I was invited to an end-of-the-year party at the home of the wealthiest kid in our class. I rode there with four or five of my friends, arrived, went into the house, and it was a scene of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I stood in the living room and something welled up inside of me something very powerful. I was in that moment filled with fear. I wasn't afraid of the situation. I wasn't afraid of the people there and what they would think of me. I was afraid of God. I was filled with a sense of the fear of God. And I knew that I should not be in that place. I ran out the front door, not really having a plan, realized that I was five miles from home, and that night walked home. I remember that walk very well. I remember as a 17-year-old walking step after step and saying again and again, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Where did that fear come from? Well, I re- reflected on my growing up. My father was very faithful in reading to us every morning from God's Word. He wasn't a teacher. I don't remember him ever making a comment. But he would start in Genesis, and we would read day by day all the way through the Bible to the end of Revelation, and then we'd start again. My dad was very concerned that we would not miss a day. My brother Ted uh, had a job very early in the morning, so my dad made us get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to read God's Word. I appreciated that. Uh, But I didn't realize that as the Word of God was being exposed to me day after day after day, this change was taking place inside of me. And in that moment, what overwhelmed me was not the temptations that were available. What overwhelmed me was not what other people would think of me. What overwhelmed me is this wonderful, protective, rescuing fear of God that came from this constant exposure to His Word. And I've thought many times of that evening. I thought many times what the course of my life may have taken had that fear of God, the result of the powerful work of the Word of God, had not captured my heart. And I'm thankful for that morning after morning after morning after morning after morning of being exposed to the truths of the Word of God. Turn, if you would, in your Bibles to Isaiah 55, page 615 in your church Bibles. Two weeks ago, I introduced you to this chapter, uh, written to people who had been in captivity, written to remind them principally of two things, God's offer of His grace and God's gift of His Word. We want to look at that second gift uh, this morning and follow as I read, beginning with verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, 
and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills before you shall break forth in the singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Look, if you would, at verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither your ways, my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Why is God making this distinction? Why is he saying, don't you understand that my thoughts are not like your thoughts? That my thoughts are higher from your thoughts in the way that that furthest twinkling star that you can barely see its twinkle is from where you stand. Why why is the prophet saying that? Because God wants his people to know how desperately they need his revelation, how desperately they need his word. Now to get that, you have to really go back to the beginning. Think about this. When God created Adam and Eve... As adult human beings, he did not build in them the ability to figure out life on their own. He created human beings who were uniquely dependent on God's revelation in order to make sense out of life. And he gave them communicative and conceptual abilities so they could process his revelation and apply it to their everyday experience. Think about this. The very first thing God does when he creates Adam and Eve is he speaks to them. It's a remarkable moment. Because although they're perfect people living in a perfect relationship with God, they are not capable of figuring life out on their own. They won't, by their own research and conversation and experience, know all the things they need to know. There are mysteries of the universe coming out of the mind of God that give you a sense of your identity and meaning and purpose that only come by means of revelation. You will never discover those by research. You will never discover those by experience. And so we could say this, that our basic need for God's revelation is not first the result of sin. It's first the result of being human. Because I'm a human being, I am dependent on God. I'm dependent on His thoughts, those beyond origin, to beyond destiny perspectives that are held in the mind of God, God who is sovereign, God who is creator, God is the definition of everything that's wise and good and true and loving, that He would speak truth to me, that truth would help me to understand who I am, what life is about, who He is, and what... I am to do with the life that he has given me. That fundamental need, first of all, is not the product of my sin. It's the product of my humanity. I would ask you this morning, are you embracing your humanity? By nature of your humanity, you need the words of God. You need him to express his thoughts to you so that you would understand things about you and life and him that you would understand in no other way. There's a second thing. I've hinted at it. That our need for the word of God And the separation between the way we think and the way he thinks is not just the product of our humanness, it's the product of our sin. Sin reduces, in some way, all of us to fools. Sin distorts the way we think. It distorts our desires. We look at the world in uh, uniquely self-centered sort of ways, and, and because of that, we need 
God to interrupt our private con- uh, conversation by his word and help us to see ourselves with accuracy and to know and to understand the things that we would know no other way. Lowell and I have thought of this many times when we celebrate our anniversary. We have been married for almost 39 years. We were married when we were five. (laughs) And we are very, very aware that we couldn't have lived in this relationship as we have without the rescuing truth of the Word of God. We would have had not clue one how to do marriage. We wouldn't know how to love one another. We wouldn't know how to deal with the difficulties that happen as you live together in a fallen world. We wouldn't know how to speak to one another. We wouldn't know what kindness is. We wouldn't know how to reconcile in moments of brokenness. We wouldn't have known the importance of forgiveness. We wouldn't have known. We wouldn't have known. We wouldn't have known. And when we celebrate an anniversary, we don't celebrate our glory. We celebrate the stunning wisdom of the Word of God that taught us things about this primary relationship of life that we would have known no other way. We wouldn't have known. We have four grown children. It is a a scary thing when that dependent infant is placed in your hands and you realize this is a real living human being who has been placed in your care. It makes your knees weak. And how we were protected and instructed and directed by the Word of God that, that told us what it means to raise up this child in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, we wouldn't have known. We wouldn't have had a clue. We would have had no ability to discern what is right and wrong, what is wise and what is foolish, what is good and bad. We wouldn't have known. We wouldn't have known. We wouldn't have known. We wouldn't have known. If God, in the goodness of His grace, hadn't directed his word and spoken through the many spokesmen that he raised up and protected his word and delivered his word to us by his grace. Brothers and sisters, do you love this book? Do you say, where would I be without this book? Do you celebrate this book? And you say, every shred of wisdom I have is here. It's this book. All the good choices I've made have been driven by this book. God, you've spoken your thoughts to me. I love you for it. Is that where you are? It's so easy for this book to be relegated to the sort of religious dimension of our lives. It's so easy for us to fall into thinking we know more than we actually know. It's so easy to relegate it to theological systems. And those are very, very important. I love the doctrine of the Word of God. But do you, do you embrace your humanity and your sin and say, I can't live without this book because it opens things to me that I would never know, I would never consider, I would never love, I would never embrace if it weren't for this book. God, you're right. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Your ways are higher than my ways. I thank you for revealing yourself to me in your book. What a reminder, not just for God's children of old who had forgotten his word, who had turned from it, but for us, that we would never forget, that we'd never quit celebrating, that we'd embrace our humanity and our sin, and embracing our humanity and our sin, we'd celebrate this beautiful gift that we've been given. 
But Isaiah wants to remind us of a second thing, of of equal glory. Look at verse 10, 11. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, make it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth that shall not return to me empty, but shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Just as when the rain comes down and nourishes the soil and those nourishments are sucked out of the soil by those plants and those plants produce food, produce fruit, and that fruit produces food, so is the Word of God. Now perhaps every Bible should have a warning label on it. There is awesome power inside of these pages. Be careful. This book will alter your life. Because behind the truths of the Word of God stands a God of awesome power and awesome sovereignty and awesome grace. And His Word will do what He's intended it for, for it to do. I think again of my own life that I had no idea as a little boy as I would yawn my way through the Old Testament as my father read the power of what I was being exposed to. I never knew that, that as, as that word was coming to me, it was changing me in the process. I didn't know that. Until that evening, it became very clear that a significant and wonderful change had happened inside of me. I stood at 17 years old. This is grace. It has nothing to do with me. It's grace. And there was something stronger in me than temptation. There was something stronger in me than the opinion of other people. There was something stronger in me than the pleasures of the moment. The power of the Word of God had changed me because God's Word will do what He's attended it to do. And God in sovereign grace before the foundations of the world raised up a man. I don't even know the final spiritual state of my father, but He raised him up as a spokesman, raised him up to speak God's Word into my life. Because God had ordained for me to be exposed to that word, and the power of that word would alter me. Praise Him. I can't even say I was a good listener, a good student. I know I, I surely said to my father many times, Are you done reading yet? I can remember my father once reading. He did this very well. He didn't alter the quasi-monotone of his voice, I had fallen asleep. He kept reading and walked over and bumped me on the head with the Bible that he was reading. But the Word was doing its work. Now, if you believe that, then you want to put yourself under its reign. Wherever the Word of God is reigning, you want to be there. You want it to water you and to grow you. You want to experience the powerful, sovereign reign of the Word of God that will do what God has purposed for it to do. Now, that begs a question. It actually should be the question in your mind right now. The question should be, okay, if, if God's Word will accomplish its purpose, then what is its purpose? What is it that the Word of God is intended to do? Uh, I've often heard preaching on this passage, and often it it ends with verse 11, and that's always kind of frustrated me. Because verses 12 and 13 really do lay out for you the ultimate purpose of the Word of God in in graphic word pictures. (coughs) For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. 
Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. I want you to hear what I'm about to say. The ultimate purpose of the Word of God is worship. The ultimate zeal for the Word of God is God's own glory. That we as His children, because of the reign of the Word of God, would become people who in every way delight in His glory and we live for His glory and celebrate His glory and worship Him in glory forever. That's the end. That all creation will turn and stand and applaud the awesome glory of God. The trees clapping, the mountains singing. That all of creation will finally do what it is meant to do. Worship the Lord forever. The purpose of the Word of God is worship. Now what's the pathway? Well, you see it here. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. It's a bit of a weird metaphor. Because you still have this rain metaphor. And and think about this, when, when uh, water, when rain rains down on a little thorn bush and it's nourished, what do you get? You get a bigger thorn bush. When rain rains down on a myrtle or a, a little briar, what do you get? You get a bigger briar. You've never seen rain fall down in your backyard, turning a bramble bush into an apple tree. It's, it's a metaphor of fundamental organic transformation, organic change. That when the rain of the Word of God comes down on you, it fundamentally alters the organic content of your heart. That you, just, you don't become a bigger and better you. You become a radically different you. Now what's the core of that difference? Here it is. It's what's seen in the history of Israel. We in our sin become people who forsake the glory of God for what glory? What glory? The temporary glories of creation, the temporary glories of self sovereignty We begin to live for our glory. We begin to make our own rules. We begin to replace God with the creation. So rather than God's glory, we'd rather have the glory of human acceptance or the glory of power or the glory of pleasure or the glory of comfort. And that way we're like that that thorn bush, uh, the thorns of our own pride, the thorns of our own greed, the thorns of our anger, the thorns of our selfishness, the thorns of our lust that are all the result of self-being in the place where only God is meant to be. And so God says, I'm going to give you my word and what that word is going to do by the power of my grace operating through it, through it is radically change you from the inside out so you no longer desire to have you in the center of your universe. You want me to be there and you no longer pursue your own glory but you pursue mine. And you want to be part of my work on earth. You want to live inside the boundaries of my truth. You want somehow, some way that your words and your thoughts and your actions would live for my glory. The purpose of God's Word is that there would be in us radical, personal change that cause us to be people who have as the center motivation of our life the glory of God. Now you will recognize, if you're able to look into the mirror of the Word of God this morning, 
that you and I aren't there yet. There is still this this skirmish of glory in our hearts. And so we need more of the transforming power of the Word of God. We need more of its rain on us, that rain that is able to turn a thorn bush into a cypress tree, a briar into a myrtle. You can't consider the wonderful encouragement of this passage without thinking about the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. How does God transform us by this book driving us to the foot of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because central, the central character of this book is the Lord Jesus. The central event of this book is His life, death, and resurrection that releases me from my bondage to me, offers me forgiveness and right standing with God, and the hope that someday every thought, every desire, every motivation, every action, every word of this man will be done in a consistent pursuit of the glory of God. Hear this. Jesus is that rain. What the word of God rains down on you is the person and work of the Lord Jesus. His transforming grace. I would ask you this morning, Do you love this book? Have you embraced how desperate your need is for it? Not just because you're a sinner, but because you're human. Never designed to figure life out on your own. Have you celebrated its power? Are you encouraged with its progressive transformation of you? And desirous of more. And are you deeply grateful. That in the pages of this book. You have met the one person. Who has the power. To alter everything in your life. The Lord Jesus Christ. And this book. Is turning self love and self-glory into the love of Jesus and a life lived to God's glory. God, help us to love this book and to run under its reign. Let's pray. Lord, how thankful we are that the God who rules, the God who creates, the God who acts with wisdom and authority is also the God who speaks. And you have spoken to us the deep mysteries of the universe that liberate and redeem in your word. Your word brings us to Jesus, to the new life that can only be found in him. Your word gives us wisdom and understanding that we could never have. Your word changes at the, at the level of the deepest motivations and desires and thoughts of our hearts. May we be those who love your word who want to be wet with its rain. And may that bear a harvest of continuing new fruit to the glory of your name. Amen.
We're going to sing next, uh, Joy to the World. Uh, That's not a mistake. These hymns should not just be relegated to the Christmas season. They're wonderful hymns of the faith, and we should sing with this kind of joy this morning. Thank you for listening to audio from Paul Tripp Ministries. Feel free to make copies of this audio to give to others, but please do not charge for those copies or alter the content in any way without permission. For additional resources, visit www.paultrip.com.